All right, so we read from uh, Revelation 3, and the title of my sermon is Synagogue of Satan, or Beware of the Concision. Amen. Um, so what we'll be looking at today is how the concision is the fake circumcision of the Jews. So it's an outward circumcision of the flesh, which is a picture of the true circumcision. The circumcision of the heart is what makes you the people of Israel. And they say they're Jews and are not because they have confidence in the flesh. Um, and they deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So in John 1, 11 to 13, uh, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So they believe they're the seed of Abraham according to the flesh, and that that's enough to save them. Um, but the seed of Abraham is not born of blood or of the flesh, it's born of God. So I'm going to show you from the scriptures why we should have no confidence in the flesh and where our confidence should be placed for salvation. So the first lie you might hear is that God has respect to persons, that somehow there's a difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. So in Acts 10, I'll get you to turn there. Um, I'll just explain to you the story in Acts 10. Um, so God, hears, uh, he hears Cornelius praying. He's a man of God, but he's not saved. He's praying uh, God sends him an angel that Cornelius was to find Peter, who was going to come and explain the gospel to him. Um, so Peter's meditating on the roof uh, when a, a sheet of uh, all manner of animals comes down from the Lord and was shown to Peter. And Peter was told to kill and eat these animals, where a lot of them were what would be considered unclean by the Jews, uh, the, the, the Jews' law. So um, we catch up in verse 14 in Acts 10 says, But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And a voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. So at first Peter didn't understand this and explains that later, but um, this is in regard to the gospel coming also to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. So we see that down in verse 34, if you want to head down there. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, that, nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So the word of God which sent unto him the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee up after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To, give all the, to him give all the prophets witness, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. Amen. So all the Old Testament prophets, they bear witness of Christ as well. And right away we see the salvation of old was exactly the same as it was in the New Testament as it is today. So down in verse 44, we'll continue. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, that's the Jews, they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So this is God showing Peter and the Jews that were with him that were also saved, that salvation and the Holy Ghost had come to the Gentiles also, that he's not a respecter of persons and nor should we be. Um, that, that's why we're commanded to judge not according to the flesh, but to judge righteous judgment. So I'll get you to turn to Acts 15. So in Acts 15, Peter's speaking with the Pharisees, other Pharisees who had believed, who were trying to teach the Gentiles that they needed to be circumcised in the flesh. Uh, and Peter shares what he learned after his vision and experiences in Acts 10. So we'll start in verse 7 of Acts 15. It says, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. 
Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. So do you notice the wording there in verse 9? It says, the purifying of, the, of their hearts. And this is referencing salvation, that there's no difference. We're all saved, Jew and Gentile, by the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's the same for us as it is for them, through the circumcision of our hearts, which I'll get to in a little bit. I'll get you to turn to Romans 2 while I read 1 Peter. So in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, it says, and, ye, and if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye that were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So again, that says that God's not a respecter of persons and he judges every man according to their works, whether they be good or bad. In Romans 2, um, we've got, but after the hardness, in verse 5, after the hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But every, glory, honour and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. I'll get you to turn to Ephesians 6. We are going to be going through pretty quick today. <laughs> I've got a lot of Bible here and not a lot of time. Um, but again, we see here what it means to not have respect to persons. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. There is none, no, no difference at all. And the only distinction that God cares about is whether or not you're believed or if you're disobedient concerning the gospel. Now in Ephesians 6 verse 5, it says this, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whosoever, uh, whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord whether he be bond or free. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. So I'll get you to turn to Colossians 3. But here we can see that when it comes to God's judgment and salvation, you are saved or condemned by your faith or your unbelief. So John 3.18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. While your rewards are judged on your deeds, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. But what we never see in the scriptures is your nationality, your ancestry, your DNA, who you are, uh, ever playing a part in your salvation. It's always been the same, and we see that again in Colossians 3. So in Colossians 3, verse 23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So who's justified in the eyes of God? It's those who are of faith. And we can clearly see from the scripture that God is no respecter of persons, there is no respect for the flesh or the circumcision made with hands or for your ancestry, your DNA, it doesn't matter who you are, everybody's the same. Amen. And we know that we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. So this brings us to the, uh, to the second line, that you're justified by the Old Testament law. So turn to Romans 3. Now a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but 
We're going to be covering some old ground. Kevin's covered some of this already. In uh, Romans 3, verse 19, Now we know that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So that's a case closed, right? I mean, that's, that's about as definitive as a statement gets. Um, the law brings the knowledge that we are sinners, but it does not save us. Um, and the Old Testament prophets, they all bear witness of that, as it says in Galatians 3. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So we'll pick up in Romans 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. There's absolutely no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes them being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So I'll get you to turn to Romans 4, just over the page. But I love that statement. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And that is definitive. It just doesn't get any clearer than that. And you'll also see in verse 29, he is the God of the Jews and of the Gentiles also. Once more proving God's no respecter of persons. This is not the last time we're going to be seeing this. It's taught all through the Old and New Testament. You'll see it everywhere. Um, so let's see some more of the Old Testament saints being saved by faith. The same gospel by which we believed and were saved. Romans 4, we'll start in verse 1. What say we then, that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? So is it just for the Jews or is it for the Gentiles as well? It's saying it's for both. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of, of the, all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, the righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith, of our father Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So we see here how Abraham was saved before he was even circumcised in the flesh. In verse 10, the circumcision of the flesh, in verse 11, was a picture of the circumcision that took place in the heart. Um, the act itself did nothing but to show who were God's people. Uh, not those who were of the flesh of Abraham, but those who were of faith. Abraham is our father also, verse 11, because we are they that be not circumcised. Abraham is also our father. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world, 
verse, verse 13, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So I'll turn to Galatians 3, and let's just see who that seed is. I know a lot of you are familiar with Galatians 3 and who the seed is, but we'll cover that again tonight. So Galatians 3, verse 5. He therefore that ministereth to you in the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And we know that's the moment that he got saved. Um, so then they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So there's a few things to cover here. The scripture foresaw that the heathen, the Gentiles, would be justified by faith. Um, it was not just a promise to the Jews only, even back in the Old Testament. Um, that it was the same time Abraham received the promise that all nations of the world will be blessed through his seed. And that, that is when Abraham believed God and, and was saved is when he, re he heard that promise and he believed it. He would be the father of many nations. And this was before he received the token of circumcision um, of the flesh. Abraham was uncircumcised in the flesh when he was saved, but his heart had already been circumcised. Um, it also shows who the children of Abraham are. They're the Jews and the Gentiles alike who have believed on the Lord. So in verse 10, we'll follow on in Galatians 3. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be, man's, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as a one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Now this is going back to Genesis 12, when that promise was made to Abraham, and he says, in thy seed shall all nations of the world be blessed. It's talking about Jesus Christ. He is the seed of Abraham. Yeah. We'll continue verse 17. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So we're just going to park it there for a minute. If it's by the law, then it's not by promise. The law is not of faith, clearly stating that it is by promise, therefore it cannot be by the law. It must be of faith. The just will live by faith. It's purely by faith in Jesus Christ. It's the only way salvation's ever been attained throughout the history of this world. Uh, in verse 16, we see the seed is Christ, and both the Jews and the Gentiles are blessed, being found in that seed through faith. So that's, that's something that was understood in the Old Testament by all the apostles and the prophets. It brings up again how God's not a respecter of persons. Um, he doesn't have some special love for Israel um, that would save them without faith. Um, it was the same for all. Without faith, all will perish in their sins, and the same goes for today. Um, I'll also mention that the, the, the King James Bible is the only one that doesn't corrupt Genesis 12 and Galatians 3 to where it, it changes seed to descendants or some other perversion of that. But we know that the King James Bible is the true inspired word of God. And it says seed, we know it says seed. And that seed is Christ. Amen, so we'll return to Romans 4. I should have told you to stay there. But we'll carry on in uh, verse 14. So Romans 4.14 says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. And we've just got through that the promise is not of the law, it's of faith only. Um, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith 
that it might be by grace. And I'll read to you, because this is something that ties in with this, Romans eleven six, And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. So the two are contrary to the other. It's, if it's of faith, it, it is of faith that it might be by grace. Therefore, it cannot be of works. And I love how clear it's stated by Paul that these two are so contrary that if it's by grace, it's not of works. If it's by works, it's not of grace. And we see that the law and faith are completely separate. If it can't, it can't be one and the other, it's got to be one or the other. So uh, we'll go back, to, back in uh, Romans 4.16. So therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but also to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. That's the promise in Genesis 12. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And now that we understand that that seed is Christ, and us in Christ, then we can understand how he can be the father of many nations, and how he can be the father of innumerable innumerable numbers, uh, as many stars as there are in the heavens. Um, Verse 19, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead... He was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification. So I'll get you to turn to Isaiah 45. But why was it written? It was written that we would know the salvations by faith in Jesus Christ, that we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to all the promises that were made to Abraham, and we will inherit with Abraham and with Christ. So in Isaiah 45, we'll uh, start at verse 17. says, but Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Now this everlasting salvation, this predates both the earth and the old covenant. This, in uh, Titus 1, 2, it says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Before he even created this world, he already had the sacrificial lamb, he already had the plan of salvation, and he already had the everlasting salvation and the everlasting gospel. And these things cannot be undone. We'll we'll read through Isaiah 45. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said, not of the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations, and have no knowledge that set up the word of their graven image, and pray unto a God that cannot save. So they're worshipping false gods here. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Saviour, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. It's not just Israel, saying all the ends of the earth. Look unto me, and be ye saved. It's the same promise. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely one shall say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. So that sounds, I mean, that sounds a lot like Galatians 3, doesn't it? You know, salvation is of the Lord for all nations. 
verse 22, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. The Old Testament taught the exact same everlasting gospel as the New Testament. And those who are found in the Lord are Israel and are justified in his sight. So we'll turn to Hebrews 11. Now this is often called the faith chapter. I love Hebrews 11 because it goes, it's like Romans 3 and Romans 4. It goes into a lot of the Old Testament saints and uh, how, how much faith they had um, and how they were saved by faith, by the grace of Jesus Christ, even in the Old Testament. We'll start in verse 8, Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise. Uh, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and with Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful, who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, which was just like us as well. You know, even Paul says, you know, to be uh, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Like he understood that this earth is not our home. We're just traveling through. We're just here for a moment. Um, Verse 14, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. This is verse 16. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And we heard that in uh, Revelation 3, uh, where it talks about how God's prepared a city made with his hands a holy city, New Jerusalem, or in Revelation 21, um, it speaks of the same thing. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, that's, that's the promise that God made to Israel, that he would be their God and they would be his people. Um, but to dwell in this new city, you've got to be part of Israel, and that means you have to be of faith. Um, but does it sound like any of the Old Testament prophets were looking for an earthly inheritance, or were they looking for a heavenly inheritance? Like, they were all looking for a heavenly. They were all saved and all looking to the promise of a heavenly inheritance, a country and a city built by God, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. They were not interested in the land. They weren't looking for an earthly kingdom. They were looking for a heavenly kingdom where Jesus Christ would rule and reign over them. So now we move on to the last point for tonight. We'll get you to turn to Deuteronomy 10. Um, The last point is in regard to salvation, circumcision is of the heart and not of the flesh. So we'll start in verse 12 in Deuteronomy 10. It says, And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy, all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold thy heaven, and the heaven of heavens is the Lord thy God, the, uh, the earth also with all that therein is. Only the Lord hath a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward." He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow, and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. Um, I'll get you to turn to Deuteronomy 30, just a few pages over. 
But again, we see the Lord has no respect of persons. And in the same breath, he's talking about the circumcision of the heart. Um, we saw that back in Acts 15 as well. And in Deuteronomy 30, he says something very similar. In verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. So, you know, we see here again that it's about the circumcision of the heart. And if you want to be a part of Israel, it's not about the circumcision of the flesh, but the circumcision of the heart. Because he's going back to the first, uh, the first commandment, which is to love thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy might. And if you do that, then your heart will be circumcised. Because in order, to, one, one thing we'll see here in Jeremiah is their hearts were not circumcised and they were worshipping other gods. And it's because they were worshipping other gods that we know that they were not saved. Um, they, they hadn't loved the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul. I'll get you to turn to Acts chapter 7, but I'll read Jeremiah 4. Jeremiah 4, 4 says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none quench it because of the evil of your doings. And Jeremiah chapter 9, it says also, verse 25 and 26, Behold, the day is come, said the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Does it sound like he's got respect to persons? He's just, everybody gets judged. Egypt and Judah and Edom and all the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the uttermost corners that dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations are uncircumcised. In, that's talking about in the flesh. And all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. So it's talking about how these people are not following after God. They're not keeping his statutes. They're not keeping his commandments. And they're, they're, they don't believe in the Lord. And we do see it again in the New Testament in Acts chapter 7. Look at verse 51. Verse 51, it says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. So he's talking about, again, the, the prophets of old, you know, the Old Testament, Israel, how their fathers resisted the Holy Ghost, they resisted Jesus Christ, they resisted the Lord God, and they were uncircumcised in their hearts. Verse 52, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. Talking about how they've killed the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, when the, uh, who have received by the law the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. So I'll get you to turn to Romans 2. Um, but here we see the contrast of the unbelieving Jews who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Um, and, uh, but back in Deuteronomy 10, 16, the command for them was to circumcise the foreskin of their hearts and to keep the statutes of the Lord, one of which is to only have one God. Because you can't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and some other God. You have to believe just in the Lord Jesus Christ, otherwise your heart will not be circumcised and you will die in your sins. It's all or nothing. Jesus wants all of you. So, but in Jeremiah, Israel was not circumcised of heart. They did have other gods who were worshipping them and breaking that first commandment. Um, so in Romans 2 verse 23, Thou that makest so boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, the circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? So if you want to be saved, you've got to keep the law perfectly. Otherwise, you just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. We know that nobody can keep it perfectly. That's why Jesus Christ had to come. Um, but that's what this is saying, that if you can keep the law perfectly, then your uncircumcision will be counted for circumcision because you will be justified in the eyes of God. But that's impossible for us. Um, and shall not circumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So we see in verse 25 says, 
The circumcision of the flesh is made uncircumcision by breaking the law. And you're, you're found a sinner by breaking the law. And the only way to not be found a sinner is to be circumcised in the heart and washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ through faith. And that's being born in the spirit, the new man, the new creature. That's being circumcised in the heart. So I'll get you to turn to Galatians chapter 5. But it's also putting a difference here. It's not between the Jew and the Gentile, because God's not a respecter of persons. We'll see more than enough scriptures to say that. But it puts a difference between the Jew who's circumcised in the heart and is is a Jew indeed, and one who uh, is circumcised in the flesh only and says they're not a Jew who is outward in the flesh, but a Jew who is one inwardly in circumcision is that of the heart. So the difference between those who trust in the Lord and those who are trusting in their flesh, whether you be Jew or Gentile. Uh, Galatians 5 verse, I think it's verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say that unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So he's talking about the circumcision of the flesh. But then he switches gears here in verse 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This uh, persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now we know Jesus said, but we're the leaven of the Pharisees. That's the false doctrine of the Pharisees. One of those was you needed to be circumcised, which we saw even Peter arguing with the Jews in uh, the Pharisees in Acts 15. Um, The very same thing. But the only circumcision that avails anything is a circumcision of the heart. Believing on the Lord and being born of the Spirit and we see that again in Galatians 6, so I'll get you to turn there. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Now, I love that term. When I was going through this sermon researching it, I came across this term, the Israel of God, and I I absolutely love that. And it is an interesting phrase, you know, because we want to know who is the Israel of God. Is it the circumcision of the flesh or the circumcision of the heart? And we've seen more than enough that God has no respect for the circumcision of the flesh. So as believers, we are the Israel of God. Old and New Testament believers accounted for the seed. And we have seen it already from Romans and Galatians and even the Old Testament scriptures attest to that. So I'm going to read to you from Exodus 19. You don't have to turn there. But this is the promise made to Israel in the Old Testament. Exodus 19 verse 5. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So the promises made to Israel in Exodus, that's identical to the promises made in 1 Peter chapter 2. Um, so who is the Israel of God? It's we are. As, we, as they were in the Old Testament, those which were of faith. And there is no difference according to the flesh. The difference is whether or not you have faith. So we'll turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start in verse 11. Should just be a, a page over. So in Ephesians 2, verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. So he's talking about the Jews who are the circumcision of the flesh made of hands, would call us Gentiles, which is another word for heathen, it's it's non-Jews. Um, but also those, you know, who were not saved. Um, 
so that at that time, verse 12, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And this is the, this is the important part. It actually lines up with 1, 1 Peter 2.10. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And in, in uh, 1 Peter 2.10 it said, which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And talking about Jesus Christ, as it continues on in verse 14, he, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Again, restating there is no difference. He's broken down that middle wall of partition between the Jews and the Gentiles. There is no difference. There is no, no more enmity between us. It says, at verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So both the Jews and the Gentiles were reconciled to God and are the Israel of God, those who are of faith. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Being a Jew means absolutely nothing unless you have faith in Jesus Christ. And then we're all Jews, we're all of Israel, and there is no difference between us. Verse 17... And came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we have both access by one Spirit and the Father. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So we're fellow citizens with the Old Testament Israel. It's not that there's two different, you know, citizenships. There's not a different rule for them and a different rule for us. We are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. There's only one household of God, Amen. and it's those who be of faith. God doesn't have anything special for them. Verse 20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So let's turn to Philippians 3. Philippians, it shouldn't, should just be a few pages over. Philippians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 2. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So just turn a couple of pages over to Colossians chapter 2. But Paul's making an important point here. He was circumcised in the flesh, it was, it was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he, he was blameless concerning the law. But he's saying he was circumcised of, the, circumcised of the flesh, but he counted that as lost as he had not been circumcised of the heart. Um, but now that he has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he recognizes that the circumcision, circumcision of the flesh profited him nothing. It was, it was worthless. So in Colossians 2 verse 6, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit and the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also ye are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision 
of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So pay attention to Colossians 2 verse 11. It says, The circumcision made without hands, and also calls that the circumcision of Christ. Now he performs that circumcision the moment you believe, making you a child of God. And that makes you also a citizen of the Israel of God, and all the promises made to Abraham apply to you as well. And just jump over to Colossians chapter 3. Um, we'll just read verse 11. Where, neither, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, born, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Again, putting no difference between us, doesn't matter where you're from. And these verses in the Old and New Testament, they just make it plain that the circumcision without hands is what justifies a man. That's the circumcision made by Christ. The circumcision of the flesh is made by hands. And that would also picture salvation of works because it's salvation that comes by man. But salvation comes by Christ. So the, the circumcision of the, of the heart is made by Christ. So, and that's the quickened spirit after you believe. It's a new creature. It's your faith that justifies you. It's not the law. It's not your works. It's not the circumcision of the flesh. Therefore, as believers, we have no confidence in the flesh. So I'll get you to turn to Romans 11. I'm just going to wrap it up right now. But the conclusion is this. Israel, after the flesh, are not saved. And they can be saved in the same manner as we were, which is by the faith in Jesus Christ alone. And the purpose of this sermon is not just to prove that the Christ-rejecting Israel of today is not the seed of Abraham. It's to edify you to, uh, by knowing that you are the children of Abraham and all the promises belong to us. And we also have a job to do, and that's where my last point comes in. So in Romans 11, verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. And jump down to verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. So our job as the ministers of reconciliation and the soul winners is to provoke them to jealousy to believing the gospel, just as their unbelief did the same for us. So they're still sons of Adam in need of salvation. It's by grace, in, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that they too can become the sons of Abraham and of Christ. Let's pray.